Thank you for waiting and welcome to this online event from Pearson. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some few housekeeping items so you will know how to participate in today's event. Before we discuss how to download any associated materials and use the platform, I would like to inform you that this session will be recorded for regulatory purposes and for our quality assurance. You can download the delegate materials for this session by clicking the resource button located at the lower right part of the Zoom menu option. You can interact with the presenter and other attendees anytime by typing your questions into the chat box, which is located at the bottom right side of your screen. Please note that anything you type into this window can immediately be seen by other delegates in the room. To enter a question or a comment, type into the bottom section of the chat window and hit enter on your keyboard. You may also use the same chat box for assistance in case you encounter any technical issues during the event. At this time, everyone is joined on mute but will have the control to unmute themselves, so please stay on mute if you don't need to speak. If your questions, click on raise hand at the menu bar at the bottom. If you don't see this, click on the icon labeled participants and select raise hand. Otherwise, try holding alt and letter Y on your keyboard. That's all I need to go through for now. Our presenter for today is Jillian Slater, and it's with great pleasure that I hand you over to her now. Thank you. Please go ahead. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jill Slater, and I'm going to be giving this presentation this morning. Um, we will move on to look at the agenda. This is for this part of the training. It introduces the important aspects of the course, focusing on specification and planning to teach the course. There's also an overview of assessment and support available from Pearson. And this part of the training is planned to, work, to last for two hours. The aims and objectives are to understand the assessment objectives for the qualification, understand the question types for the qualification, understand the mark schemes, practice using the mark schemes using exemplar student work, and we will spend quite a bit of time on that and then learn about the support provided by Pearson around assessment and exemplars. Now, welcome to Pearson. Pearson Edexcel are the world's leading learning company and the UK's largest awarding organisation. Best place to provide qualifications aligned to the British educational system. Our international heritage stretches back over 150 years. And today we partner with schools, universities and employers worldwide, offering world-class globally recognized qualifications to over 3.5 million students a year. Now we're going to have a quick overview of the specification. It's a modular specification divided into IAS and IAL. The total qualification is a, is a total of six externally assessed units or modules. Units one, two, and three, which you can see now, comprise the IAS. The content of these three units provides students with a grounding for A-level studies. Units one and two are each split into two main topics and themes. So you can see unit one is molecules, diet, transport and health. So that is subdivided into molecules, transport and health is topic one. And then topic two is membranes, proteins, DNA and gene expression. If we move on to look at the second part of the course, the IA2, this would be taught in the second year of study, units four, five and six. And the content of these units is focused around developing a good understanding of fundamental biological processes. These are the more demanding biological processes. 
And again, units four and five are split into two main themes. In both the IAS and IA2, unit three and unit six are the practical skills. In unit three, it will be practical skills just from topics one and two. But in unit six, it can be experimental skills acquired from all four units, one, two, four, and five. We're going to go on from there to look at the assessment objectives. I'll just keep an eye on the chat box at the same time. Yes, I don't. That's fine. There are three assessment objectives and they describe the type of learning that is being assessed. So A01, assessment objective one, is to demonstrate knowledge and understanding of science. Questions matching this assessment objective will require students to demonstrate learning of biological knowledge and understanding, which is detailed in the specification. So anything in A01 is from the specification. A02A is the application of knowledge and understanding of science in familiar and unfamiliar contexts. So questions matching this assessment objective will require students to apply their biological knowledge and understanding. It will often involve the application of learning to a novel or unfamiliar context. AO2B is analysis and evaluation of scientific information to make judgments and reach conclusions. So questions matching this assessment objective will require students to use their biological knowledge and understanding to make sense of information provided in the examination. It will often involve the application of learning to a novel or unfamiliar context. A03 is experimental skills in science, including analysis and evaluation of data and methods. Any question that assesses practical skills will match this assessment objective. So we're going to look at where each of the assessment objectives are, obset, uh, are assessed. The assessments for, all for the qualification must match the specified assessment objectives target. So when the paper's drawn up, Apart from checking for the content, it's checked to make sure that the assessment objectives are correctly distributed. The main assessment objectives for unit one, two, four, and five are A01 and A02A. These assessment units also have an element of A02B. AO3 will be exclusively assessed in the units three and six examinations. For the unit one and two exams, approximately 35 out of 80 marks will be AO1 and the same for AO2. The remaining 10 mark, AO2A, the remaining 10 marks will be AO2B. For the unit four and five examinations, the AO1, AO2A balance shifts a little with approximately 34 out of 90 marks for AO1 and 39 out of 90 marks for AO2. The remaining 17 marks are AO2B. We're now going to go on to think about the command words. Students should pay particular attention to the command words used in questions. These command words will identify the type of response required. For example, 
two common command words are describe and explain. Describe the cardiac cycle and explain the need for a cardiac cycle would require quite different responses. If you look at Appendix 7 taxonomy on page 68 in the specification, that lists the vocabulary or command words that will be used in questions and what is required to answer questions with those command words. <clears throat> Sometimes the command word identifies the assessment objective. However, usually the command words need to be interpreted in the context of the question or alongside the specification to identify the relevant assessment objective. <clears throat> this slide shows how different command words have been used to assess different assessment objectives. Some of the command words, those in red, will almost always be assessing A01, e.g. compare and contrast, complete, draw, state, name. Some will be gener generally associated with AO2A. Those are the ones in green, such as calculate, determine, show, Others will be largely restricted to AO2B, those in blue, assess, comment, criticize, discuss, and evaluate. However, a small group of frequently used command words will be used across all the assessment objectives. These are describe, explain, and suggest. In the practical skills papers, Unit three and six, any command word can refer to AO3. It, if you look at AO1, it says that most multiple choice questions will be AO1. There are 10% of multiple choice questions on each paper. They will mainly be AO1, but not entirely. Some of them will um, test other assessment objectives. So now we're going to have a look at how you can map assessment objectives and the questions that we're going to look at throughout this presentation are all in the sample assessment materials on paper WBI11, which you can access uh, from, peers, from Edexcel website. If you're going back through this presentation afterwards, it, you would probably benefit from having matching it to that question paper. So if we have a look at these questions, state what is meant by osmosis, explain why oxygen molecules can pass directly through the cell membrane, calculate the volume of blood, Explain the difference between the disassociation curves. Explain why the codon for, e, for the DNA genetic code must contain at least three bases. Explain how a particular mutation, which is given on the paper, results in a non-functioning CFTR protein. So can you I won't ask you to enter the next time I'll ask you to enter them in the chat box, but can you just spend a couple of minutes thinking about which assessment objective you think each one matches, and then we'll have a look at what they were matched to when they were in.
And I've just seen there's a question in the chat box about differentiating between what's required from a comment and an evaluate question. To some extent, it depends on the context of the question. A lot of these questions, particularly comment and evaluate, require an analysis of data, either experimental data or an experimental technique or an unfamiliar context of biological material. And the question needs to be read in the context of what is given on the exam paper. I hope that helps. Right, if we look at these assessment objectives, right. state what is meant by osmosis is assessment objective one, because osmosis is a specification term, candidates should be able to recall the meaning of the term. State is almost always used for AO1. Explain why oxygen molecules can pass, pass directly through the cell membrane. That is 2A because candidates should know the structure of the cell membrane, but they're being asked to apply this knowledge to explain why oxygen is able to pass through the membrane. Calculate the volume of blood is 2A. It's a calculation using data provided and is considered to be an application of knowledge and therefore AO2A. Calculate questions will in general be AO2A. Explain the difference between the dissociation curves and these are dissociation curves that are given in, on the question paper. They are candidates are being asked to explain them. This is considered analysis and evaluation of scientific information. So it is AO2B. Explain why each codon for the DNA genetic code must contain at least three bases. Although this is an explain question, it is AO1 because from the specification, candidates are required to understand the nature of the genetic code. So in answering this question, candidates are demonstrating their understanding. So the correct assessment objective is A01. Explain how a mutation that is described in the question results in a non-functioning CFTR protein. That is assessment objective 2A, because candidates need to apply different specification points to provide an answer to this question. So they're taking their knowledge from different places and putting it together. We now have some more questions, which I would like you to have a look at, and I will give you a few minutes if you could put what you think are the assessment objectives into the chat box. We will have a look at all of them and then we'll go through them all together. You put what you think they are into the chat box and then we'll talk about them.
We've got quite a few in the chat box. I'll give you just another minute to let a few more people put their ideas in. We'll have a look at it. Most of you put in, I think all of you put in, put it in that state what is meant by the term phenotype is assessment objective one. Phenotype is a specification term and candidates should be able to recall the meaning of the term. And as we've said, state is almost always A01. The next question, calculate how many times bigger is 2A. Calculations are considered to be an application of knowledge and therefore 2A. Explain how the appearance of, I won't try and pronounce that, show it is adapted to its habitat. And again, this is using information that will be in the question. So it's 2A, candidates are applying their biological understanding of adaptation using information provided to them. They're given a prokaryotic cell. And asked to draw three labeled features on the diagram. A01 candidates are expected to know the structure of bacteria, and by drawing these structures, they're demonstrating their understanding. So the correct assessment objective is A01. The next question, explain the distribution of bacteria in the digestive system. Use the information in the diagram and table to support your answer. This covers a, a, 2A and 2B. They are both applying their biological understanding and using this to interpret information provided in the question. And then the final, describe the role of the rough uh, endoplasmic reticulum is a straightforward application of biological knowledge. So it is A01. We're now going to come on to think about the language in questions. It is really important that candidates read the question carefully. Many candidates produce answers that have got lots of correct biology, but gain relatively few marks because they're not answering the question being asked. And a significant reason for this is that candidates do not read the question carefully. As well as the command words, Candidates need to consider the context of the question. Are they being asked to explain how something happens or why it happens? Are they being asked to calculate a percentage increase or a percentage decrease? Is the question asking about a particular example, e.g. this protein, these enzymes? Now, if you look at these two answers, the question is anticoagulants, antiplatelets and thromb thromb thrombolytics are drugs used to treat blood clots. One anticoagulant binds to the active site of thrombin. Explain how this drug reduces blood clotting. So they're being asked to explain something. There's two marks of this question. Response A wouldn't gain any marks because although what they've put might be correct in some circumstances, they've not read the question carefully and have explained how a different anticoagulant would reduce clotting. Response B gains two marks because it's used the information given, 
to say that the anticoagulant stops thrombin binding to fibrinogen, so fibrinogen cannot be converted to fibrin. It is, that just shows how important it is to read the question carefully. Now we're going to think about the mark scheme and how the mark scheme is drawn up. Mark schemes describe how a paper is to be marked. There, the mark scheme identifies the marks for each question. It's produced at the same time as the paper. However, it's adjusted after candidates have sat the exam account for the sort of responses that they are producing. It's, it's not changed significantly, it is adjusted. The mark scheme for the majority of questions in IAL, IAL biology papers are point-based. This means there are independent marking points for which a mark can be awarded. In general, for a point space mark scheme, the number of marking points will be equal to or possibly one more than the number of marks available. So for a question worth four marks, there will be four or possibly mark five mark points. In each of the unit one, two, four and five examination papers, there will also be one or two levels based questions. The mark schemes for levels based questions are different and we will look at an example later. So we're going to look at using the mark scheme. The mark scheme provides the answer for a question. Questions are marked by experts who interpret and apply the mark scheme to candidates' responses. There may be a number of options for a particular marking point and some guidance is, to prov is provided as to what alternative wording is acceptable. Each marking point is a standalone mark. Candidates don't need to gain the first mark in order to gain the second mark and so on. So this is an example of a points-based mark scheme to a question. It's a fairly typical mark scheme. The question is worth three marks and there are three marking points. So the first column gives the question number, identifies the question. The answer is provided in the second column. Each marking point is given as a separate bullet point. Additional guidance for each marking point is provided in the third column. Note that two types of additional guidance are provided, ignore and accept. These are self-explanatory, but in this example, chemicals would not be accepted in place of enzymes. In contrast, in the second marking point, thickens or becomes impermeable would be accepted as alternatives to hardens for the zona pellucida. But zona pellucida is the only term that is acceptable for that part of the mark. Now, if we have a look more closely at the first marking point in this mark scheme, these, these conventions with brackets apply to any A-level mark scheme. Now, the first thing to be aware of is that the mark, marking point is fairly substantial. To gain the mark, the candidate needs to address the full marking point. So they must mention cortical granules fusing with membranes and release of enzymes to gain the mark. And this is characteristic of mark schemes in the new IAL qualification. Now, if we have a look at the use of brackets in the answer box, curly brackets identify alternatives, one of which must be present. So in this case, candidates must refer to 
cortical granules or cortical vesicles. Smooth brackets identify contextual information that may be omitted in the candidate's response, but should not be contradicted. So the mark would be awarded if candidates described cortical granules fusing with the cell membrane and releasing enzymes. However, if they suggested that the granules fuse with the sperm cell membrane, the content, context is wrong and the mark would not be awarded. And that just exemplifies that. Now, if we, if we look at the level-based mark schemes, a number of six mark questions, there are always six mark questions, not fewer than that. And there will be at least one and sometimes two on each of the papers for units one, two, four, and five. And these the mark schemes for a level-based question have two components. First of all, they have the indicative content, which is an indication of the sort of creditworthy comments candidates might make. The indicative content that's included in an answer can be a good indication of the quality of the answer. However, depending on whether or not they've answered the question correctly, the number of indicative content comments a candidate makes and the score awarded to the response may not correlate. So we've got a question that says, explain it again, it's based on information already given on the question paper. And it says, explain what the solution of sugars should contain to preserve pineapples. Use the information in the table to support your answer. So the sort of things that might be included is that the sugar solution used has a lower water potential than the cytoplasm of the cell. The sugar solution should be hypertonic so that water will pass out of the cytoplasm by osmosis. Concentration of the sugar solution should be the same as the cytoplasm so that sugars will not diffuse out. And the Ds and the Es refer to description and explanation. <laughs> the indicative... The indicative content is then used to create the second element of the level-based mark screen scheme. So this part of the mark scheme is the levels description. So it's divided into level one, level two, and level three. And then each level is subdivided in whether one mark or two marks can be awarded. And the level descriptors describe how indicative content should be interpreted to award a particular level. The sophistication of the response increases as you go from level one to level three. And you have the candidates have to achieve all of level one in order to move on to level two and the same all of level two to move on to level three. So it's not a question of just counting up the number of indicative marks they've got. They've got to fulfill one level before they can move on to the next level. So we're now going to have a look at an actual mark scheme. And we are going to have a look at how some questions can be marked. 
And I'm going to ask you in a few minutes to be looking at some questions and marking them and putting your answers into the chat box. The questions are all in the resources pack that you've received. The mark scheme and comments will be shown in the PowerPoint, but the, the response, the candidate responses are not in the PowerPoint. So we're going to consider how a mark scheme is applied and we're going to take a look at a paper and a mark scheme. On the front of the mark scheme is the general marking guidance and it is there, there for examiners. It is consistent across all mark schemes. It's a series of bullet points that examiners need to make sure they are aware of. And the guidance is, in, is designed to encourage positive marking, which rewards candidates for what they know, rather than penalising them for what they don't know. It's important that all candidates receive the same treatment. The first candidate must be marked in exactly the same way as the last. and, and Examiners are given are taken through the mark scheme before they start to mark and explained. It is explained to them what is needed to apply the mark scheme. They should be applied positively. Examiners should mark according to the mark scheme. The, all marks on the mark scheme should be used appropriately. They're all designed to be awarded. Examiners should award full marks if deserved. And where some judgment is required, mark schemes will provide the principles by which marks will be awarded. Examiners all report back to team leaders. So if they are in any doubt, they've got someone to consult. The principle that Edexcel use is that any crossed out work, if it's just crossed out and nothing is written as, a, as an alternative, then it is marked. If it's crossed out and alternative response has been given, then it is the alternative response that is marked and the crossed out word work is ignored. Right, so we're going to have a look at a question, describe the conclusions that can be made about the risk factors for CVD. Use the information in the graph to support your answer. Again, this question is from the SAMS paper and some information was given about the risk factors for CVD. There are two marks available and there are two marking points. So have a look at the exemplar responses to this question that you've got in your pack. There are four responses. So if you have a look at all four of them, decide what marks you would award using this mark scheme and chat, put your answers or what mark you would give to all of them into the chat box. I'll give you a few minutes to do that.
I'm looking at the question about apply, applying the mark scheme. If the second part of an answer contradicts the first marking point, do they still get the first marking point? If they write something that totally contradicts it within the same answer, then no, they can't have the marking point. If they write smoking increases the risk of CVD, and then they put age increases the risk, but smoking decreases the risk, then they've contradicted themselves. They couldn't have the smoking mark, but they could still have the age mark. Uh, this question is less likely to happen, but there are instances where it might. Um, what we look for is a specific statements on the mark scheme. So if they've talked about something that's not on the mark scheme, not fully related to the question, but is actually incorrect, that can be ignored as long as it doesn't contradict what the mark scheme is looking for. So for instance, in this question, if they made the two statements, but then incorrectly went on to say the effects of smoking on, on the wrong part of the body or on different effect on the lungs, something that was not relevant to the question, that would be ignored because they are being asked to use, it, use the information from the graph. I hope that helps a bit. Right. Can we? Can you put your answers a bit? Oh, we've got some in the chat chat box now. I think. Students can write their answers in bullet points, and in actual fact, they won't be penalised necessarily for writing in bullet points in the asterisk questions, but they have to be, because they will be being asked to discuss or evaluate, it shouldn't be just a series of facts. If they just put a series of facts, they probably won't have answered the question. I'll give you a couple more minutes, though, so to put the marks in uh, on the whole agreeing with the marks that were awarded. These are student responses, although it's a sample paper, they are responses from a paper that was set and has been answered by students and has been marked by examiners. I'm leaving Ellie, who I can see is working on it, to help those of you that are struggling to access the resources. So response A was given two marks for saying as the age grows, the relative risk will increase. And in every age group, the risk is higher in smokers and non-smokers. Response B, also got two marks. Response C gets one mark. 
because it only says that smokers have a higher risk of developing CVD than non-smokers. Make some comment about the effects of age, but it doesn't actually explain. And again, one mark for the final one. This is a comparison question. You have to use the words increase or decrease or higher, not just state the risk for each group. And the next question we're going to look at is a fairly straightforward genetics question. It says rabbits can have brown or white fur. The heterozygous rabbit will have brown fur. So from that, you can conclude that brown fur is dominant. So it asks for a genetic diagram to show genotypes and phenotypes. So you need both of the baby rabbits produced if two heterozygote rabbits were bred together. So you have to draw a diagram. It says a diagram. Candidates have to draw a diagram. And in the diagram, they've got to show the genotypes of the parents or the alleles in the gametes, genotypes of the offspring, and then the corresponding phenotypes to match the genotypes that are given. So you have got Four of those questions, if you could mark them again and put the marks into the chat box, please.
Right, we'll have a look at the marks that were awarded for this question. Now, this question also gives an example of the positive marking that is applied. So the first response was given three marks. They've got parental gametes and offspring genotypes are correct in the diagram. And it was taken that it could be inferred which genotypes applied to which phenotypes from the diagram that have been drawn. So that was given all three marking points. The second one very clearly gets three marks. The third response wasn't given anything because, because they got the first because it hadn't got the correct gametes, it wasn't possible to get the correct answer. Um, so that didn't get any marks. Now, the third one was given three marks because it's got a clear key. And although the convention is for capital for dominant and lowercase for recessive, it doesn't. That, that's just a convention. And because they have made it absolutely clear which genotype is linked to, which not um, convention they have used is applied to which phenotype and genotype, they were awarded the three marks. So now we're going to look on to a question that says a calculate question. So we've got the, with this question carries on to use it to calculate a number of heterozygous pairs of rabbits were bred together and produced 284 baby rabbits. Calculate the number of homozygous brown rabbits, heterozygous brown rabbits, and white rabbits produced. Because this is three different responses, three different calculations with three different answer lines, there is no carry forward within the question. However, there is carry forward if the got um, incorrect ratios in the previous part. So you have got a number of responses, two responses. So if you could quickly put into the chat box the marks that you would give them. Fairly straightforward question, this. But I'll answer a couple of... Move on to this question in a minute, but there was a couple of questions on the chat box. Um, the previous question, D, D was given three because as I said, it is a convention that we use uppercase 
for the dominant allele, lowercase for the recessive allele, but it is only a convention. They can actually use any letters they want as long as they make it clear, which this one does in the key, what they are using them for. And they obviously, although they didn't the other way around to what is con convention, they had the heterozygous as brown. So they were not confusing which was recessive and which was dominant. Um, there isn't any error carried forward if they get the, um, the original gametes wrong. Yeah, and we've got lots of responses. So A gets three marks, is very clear, well set out. Um, all three answers on the answer lines are correct. The final mark, the second question gets one mark because they've only got one answer right and each of the answers are looked at separately when there's three answer lines. Right, next question that we're going to look at is about haemophilia and the inheritance of haemophilia. So candidates are being required to apply their understanding of the inheritance of red-green colour blindness, which they will have learnt about as an example of an excellent inheritance pattern. They're given information that says haemophilia is inherited in a similar way. They're asked to explain why more males than females are affected with haemophilia A. So these are the marks that we're looking for because the gene or allele is located on the X chromosome. The defective allele is recessive, or the allele that causes haemophilia is recessive. Males with haemophilia will only have that allele. And it gives alternatives that are acceptable in the additional guidance. So, and don't forget about the curly and the smooth brackets and the importance of those. Right, you've got some responses to this question. You've got four responses. Could you have a look at them, decide what mark you would give them, and put that into the chat box, please. Thank you.
but we're getting <clears throat> much more variation in responses this time, largely because candidates struggle to express mark point three clearly. I will show you the agreed marks and then I'll come back to the mark scheme to think about So Mark point, the first one was given three marks. <clears throat> Candidates often use terms such as it and they, which can be accepted as long as it's in the context of the question. So it was accepted as referring to hemophilia for mark point one in response A. So that got the three marks. B didn't get anything, there was nothing seen there. In question C, or response C, quite a few of you gave this two marks. Now, when it was marked, it was given all three marks. But mark point three is very borderline. Higher chance of having a healthy X. Females have a higher chance of having a healthy X. It's just about equivalent to the additional guidance for mark point three. If we go back and have a look at that, healthy nor Males will not carry a healthy normal alleles. Females need both defective alleles to be homozygous. That was just about acceptable for mark point three. It is possible that some examiners would not have given it because with candidates don't always write what you want them to write. So a judgment sometimes has to be made as much emphasis as possible on consistency is made when examiners are being trained to apply the mark scheme and discussions around it. But there'll always be some expression that candidates will express it in such a way that it comes down to the judgment of the examiner. And then D, they wrote an awful lot, but the marks were actually given in the last three lines. Well, the first mark is given on the second line, and then unless the female offspring acquires both recessive alleles, the disease is not expressed as the dominant allele suppresses it, gives it mark point two and mark point three. As it says, it's recessive. And it says the female has to have both alleles in order to have the disease. Again, it's not the most straightforward way of expressing it but it does get the marks. We're going to very quickly have a look at how the multiple choice questions are set out and how the mark scheme is set out. Um, there are 10% of the marks in each paper, one, two, four, and five will be for multiple choice. They all follow a standard format of a question stem followed by four options, only one of which is correct. And then in the mark scheme, it gives the correct answer. <clears throat> and then where appropriate, gives an explanation of why the other answers are not correct, just to ensure there is only one correct answer. Now, the next question we're going to look at is a compare and contrast answer. In order to gain full marks, candidates need to give both similarities and differences. You can't get full marks for a compare and contrast answer if you only give similarities or only give differences. And to ensure that this is the case, the question is written and the mark scheme constructed so that in this case, there are two similarities and one difference. It might be 
two similarity, two differences and one similarity, or it might be two similarities and two differences because you've still got to get one from each side in order to get full marks. So they're asked to construct, com compare and contrast the structure of amylose with the structure of a malapeptin. The additional guidance to examiners is not to piece together. They have to be, they have to be comparing or contrasting the two um, molecules. Um, note that polymers is in smooth brackets. It's alpha glucose that is required. Uh, bonds or links are alternatives for the second marking point. If the alpha is applied to the glycosidic bonds, then the first marking point can be given, even if they only refer to glucose. It's quite a bit of additional guidance there. Right. I will leave the mark scheme up. Can you have a look at the responses that you've got and put into the chat box the marks that you would give them?
Right, we'll have a look at the marks that were given for these. You have given quite a bit of variation here. So the first response gets two marks because it clearly expressed the similarities and differences in the bonding. So it got mark point two and mark point three. But there's no reference to alpha glucose, so not mark point one. And what the candidate has done is compared and contrasted the functions of the molecules, which is not what they're required to do and not answering the question. Response B again got two marks, mark point two and mark point three, because it missed the alpha in front of glucose. So it didn't get mark point one. Now, I see that it's got alpha scattered all over the place, but it's alpha, what it's not linked the alpha to the glycosidic. So, so that was not an acceptable alternative. Um, response C gave, gained all three marks. In this case, the benefit of the doubt was given because alpha uh, amylose and amylopectin are polymers of alpha glucose, not alpha glucose monomers. But in the context of the question, it seemed fair to interpret it, interpret the sentence as amylose and amylopectin are made from alpha glucose monomers and allow the candidate to have mark point one. Um, again, it's easy to see how you might so on some occasions might come to a different conclusion. And then response D gets two marks. And um, it's got the glycosidic, but the comparison of the bonds. And by saying that they've both got one well, four glycosidic bonds, they get the comparison, the similarity and the difference. Right, we're going to go on to look at question that this is based on information that was given about an amoeba and explain how the uptake of substances would be affected if the amoeba increased its number of pseudopodia. So the answer has to have an element of, of explanation. So it says, what would happen if the, inf the pseudopodia were increased and why that would affect the uptake of substances? Although an increased surface area will speed up uptake, it doesn't mean that there'll be any increase in the amount of substance taken up. So for marking point two, candidates need to be describing an increased rate of uptake or faster uptake, not an increase in uptake. This is an important biological principle and it is something that will come up from time to time. So have a look at the exemplar responses to this question and put the marks into the chat box. If you put them into the chat box as you've had a look at them.
I think for D, going back to the previous amylose and malapectin, it says that amylopectin has got one four and one six bonds. Amylose does that have one four glycosidic bond, meaning it won't be able to break down quickly. I think it was taken that they meant to write does not have one four glycosidic bond. That would make the sentence make sense. And although it's not asked up for the effect of the bonding, the explanation it gives that it won't be able to break down quickly is linked to not having glycosidic bonds. So that mark was given. Right, if we have a look at the responses to the marks that were given, and I noticed that one of um, Right, now I've got in my notes, which I would agree with, that I was sent, that A, B, and C each gained one mark because uptake of substances or uptake would be more were not allowed for mark point two. And in response B, it was accepted, but they were referring to an increase rather than increase in rate. A question like this, you are looking for faster, increase in rate, faster rate, rather than just an increase in uptake. So I think B would have been given one mark, but I can see that it is a, a conflicting one. Um, and D gained the two marks because very clearly stated that the uptake of substances, the rate of uptake would be steeper. Surface area to volume ratio was accepted, even though the mark scheme says surface area. Um, I do think B should only be one mark, not because it says it, but because it doesn't say rate. If it said it was faster, that would be fine. Now, the next question we're going to look at is a level based question. It's identified as level based by the asterisk. It's got six marks. It's using information in the table to support the answer. Um, it would probably be worth your while after this session actually looking at, you can access the SAMS paper on um, Pearson's website. And if you go back through them, it would just help clarify where the marks were given. But 
it's there's some three types of mutations are shown and it says explain explain the possible effects of these three types of mutation on the amino acid sequence coded for by this length of DNA. So it's a length of DNA that's shown. It's an explained question and it's a level based question. So the type of indicative content, you've got your three types of mutation, substitu substitution, deletion and insertion. The effects of each of those. So, for instance, substitution only affects one triplet code and may not affect, may not change the amino acid with an example taken from the table. And again, it may result in a stop codon with an example. The effects of a deletion with an example at the end. An insertion, again, an explanation of what, what effect it will have with an example at the end. And students are required to use these examples to show that they are making use of the information in the table, applying unfamiliar knowledge or applying their knowledge to an unfamiliar situation. So that is what they might comment on. And then this is how it is marked into levels. So. A correct statement about mutations will get them one mark. If they comment on one aspect with one illustration or two aspects commented on but no illustrations, they will get all of level one, so that gives them two marks. To move on to level three, they need they need the aspects commented on with co corresponding illustrations. If they, if they describe two aspects um, with both of them having illustrations or three aspects, but only one or two illustrations, then that gives them the first part of level two, which is three marks. If they comment on three aspects with corresponding illustrations that gives them all of level two which is four marks <laughs> and then for level three it goes up to four aspects with illustrations and then five aspects with illustrations So if you have a look, I will leave that up. And if you have a look at the responses that you've got, you have got three responses. If you have a look at them, then we will, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Give a bit longer to do these because they take a bit more thought and then we will move on, we will go through it. Again, if you put your answers into the chat box. When it means, when it says illustrations, if we go back, hang on, hang on. 
So for in, it means the examples. So a substitution that's using their knowledge to say what a substitution is, and then from the table they're given, an illustration is that number six becomes A, so it would still code for leucine. If you're talking about change amino acid, e.g. number one becomes G, resulting in valine. Um, the illustration for deletion is if you remove base four and the sequence becomes methan methionine, serine, phenylalanine, threonine. So those are the illustrations. I hope that helps. So those are the aspects that they might comment on. A substitution changing the amino acid is the aspect. And then the illustration is the ones that were given previously. A deletion can change the sequence, then an illustration. <laughs> so it's using the information in the table to answer the question. I hope that makes it a bit clearer. So if you start to put your answers in the chat box. And the question was. Explain the possible effects of these three types of mutation, which were substitution, deletion, and insertion on the amino acid sequence coded for by this length of DNA. So you've got a length of DNA and you've got the amino acids it codes for, and you're being asked to use your knowledge of the three types of mutations to explain what effect it might have on the length of DNA. Um, Nadia, to go back to the aloes and the malapectin, when this was marked, it was interpreted it seemed fair to interpret the sentence as amylose and amylopectin are made from alpha glucose monomers and allow the candidate to have mark point one. In the context of the question, it was interpreted that they should get that mark. Um, and as you will realize on different occasions, a different examiner might come to a different decision, but there will always be there will always be judgment made by examiners. Um, we don't want candidates just to regurgitate um, textbook, textbook answers. We want them to apply their knowledge. But that does mean that there will always be a level of interpretation or judgment by examiners.
Right, we will have a look at the marks that were awarded. These are the these are the level based questions are probably the most difficult to mark as well as the most difficult to answer. Uh, but the the breakdown of the levels helps to clarify what is needed. So the first response got one mark, it was level one. It gives one relevant aspect is commented on because it says the amino acid will not change. But that was restricted to level one. B got three marks because several aspects were commented on. Substitution may still produce the same amino acid. Um, deletion and addition would result in different amino acids. It gives one example, substitution of GAA to GAC would change glutamic acid into aspartic acid. That is the only illustration that's given. So that is why it gets, although several aspects are commented on, that's why it's restricted to three marks. It's level two, three marks. The final answer received two marks because it says it gives several aspects. It says what, what, substitute, what effect a substitution might have, um, what deletion insertion might do, but it doesn't give any illustration from the table. So a number of aspects, but no illustrations. Um, these tend to become clearer as if, if it's a marker, I've done a lot of marking. And as you mark more of the question on, on that particular exam paper, it becomes easier to apply the mark scheme when you have seen more examples of what um, students have actually written, candidates have written. We just got a couple more questions to look at. This is it says determine whether this person is healthy. So they're given some information. Determine is a new command word in this qualification. And the answer to a determined question must include an element which is quantitative. So they're required to use the information provided in the question to determine if a person is healthy. So the two marking points, the first is for determining the pulse pressure from the information that they're given. And the second is for recognizing that a difference greater than 3.75 kilopascals, that is greater than 25% of his, his systolic pressure means a person is healthy. So the first part is a calculation and the second part is understanding what that means. And the data for the calculation is taken from a graph. Consequential error was allowed for the second marking point. So if they calculated the pulse pressure was less than 25% of the systolic, they could get in mark point two for stating that the person was unhealthy. So there are three examples for you to have a look at. If you could put the marks that you would give into the chat box. This is much more straightforward than the level based one, so we'll, we'll spend quite as long on this. And then we've got one more question to look at.
Right. Going back to the amylose and the malapectin, it, the Mark scheme says um, we can accept glucose if alpha was indicating when referring to the glycosidic bonds. But I think the alpha has to actually go in front of the glycosidic rather than the 1, 4. Right, the marks that were awarded, the first one got both marks. He calculated it correctly and interpreted it correctly by saying they were healthy. B didn't get any marks because the pulse pressure was incorrectly calculated by giving 5.2 instead of 5.3. There's no indication of it being 25% of the systolic, which would have been allowed. But it is it still what they have calculated still means that the person would be healthy rather than unhealthy. So the statement is incorrect. And then part C again, no marks, um, incorrect calculation of the pulse pressure and incorrect interpretation of what they've got. Um, D gained one mark for the correct calculation of the pulse pressure, but then interpreted that as being not healthy, so they didn't get the second mark. Now, the final question that we're going to look at, the command word for this question is suggest. So candidates are expected to use their biological knowledge in an unfamiliar or novel context. The suggest command word will be used for no more than 10% of the available marks in a paper. In the additional guidance, the ignore where molecules may be found. Because the context is unfamiliar, candidates shouldn't be penalized for, for suggesting measuring a molecule in an inappropriate location. So measuring carbon phosphate in the blood, liver, kidney, et cetera, would all be accepted, as would simply suggesting carbon phosphate without a specific location. Now, it is a bit, I, I apologize, but I haven't got the information that was given in the question, so I can't give it to you. I would, as I say, I would compare, I would go back and just look at this with the um, SAMs that are in the, uh, on the website. But have a look at the marks that were given and see what you think you would give it. This is the last question that we're looking at. So 
if you put your marks into the chat box, Now, what the question is actually asking is to use the information in the table to explain what will be tested for or how an inherited genetic disorder can be tested for. So you've got genetic screening, you've got a biochemical test, and you've got family history, which are the three different ways that an inherited genetic disorder can be tested for. And you can actually get the marks without naming specific tests or molecules because you wouldn't, candidates wouldn't be expected to have learned that information. So I can see there's quite a lot of variation in the marks that are being given. So we'll have a look at the agreed marks. Now, response A gained one mark because that's mark point two for saying the concentration of ammonia would increase. It's a named molecule that would increase. B gets all three marking points. It's mark point two for no citrulline being produced, which is a named molecule whose levels will differ. Mark point one for reference to a genetic screening method, which is amniocentesis. And mark point three for using a family for referencing a family history. C gains mark point three only for genetic pedigree or family history, and D gained mark point two only for a high ammonia concentration. Right, I hope this has been useful to you looking at, at um, actual examples of student marks candidate responses and the marks that were given. Um, we now come into the final part of the presentation, where we're looking at the, the support that Pearson provides for you as teachers. And one of the first things is the examiner's report, which is produced for each paper after the exam, the principal examiner considers the performance of the paper. The report will draw on attention to areas where candidates did well and those where they did not. It will include consideration of the marking points that candidates gained or did not gain for each question. And it will also be examples of candidates' responses to illustrate why particular marks were not were or were not awarded. So, for instance, this is an examiner's report on 
the performance of the cohort answering this particular question. Cand um, candidates were asked to explain the importance of the three inorganic ions from the graph. Nearly all candidates could explain the importance of nitrate ions. Fewer could explain the importance of calcium and magnesium. Didn't expand the explanations. And a small minority of candidates described what would occur to a plant deficient of these inorganic ions, which was not credit worthy. These reports can be shared with students, particularly if you use peer marking or of exam papers. For each exemplar used, there'll be an examiner comment explaining how this particular response scored in the exam and will identify why marks can or can't be awarded. This is a cohort response, a cohort comment. Examiner feedback on cohort performance, this time for a level-based question. What candidates were able to do? The fact that a lot of candidates did not imply their knowledge to the given, given context, which will always limit the marks. Um, You've got to relate descriptions to the given context to access levels two and three, which is what we saw in the response that we looked at. Again, an examiner's comment. On a particular response, and there's also an examiner's tip at the bottom. And the examiner's tip are suggestions to students that will help them prepare for a particular type of question or avoid common mistakes in answering a particular type of question. So these examiner's reports come out after the exam and they are designed to assist with future teaching and both when preparing your lessons and preparing your students for exams and also allowing the students themselves to see the feedback from the exam. Now, there is support available at every stage. Free resources and support for planning, teaching and learning, exam preparation, and then results support when the exams come out. And all of these are free and available online. The web page for Pearson has four tabs. It's got specification, it's got sample assessment materials, which I was referring to, exam materials, which are documents, including past papers, mark scheme and examiner's report. And of course, this is continually added to as more paper, more exams are sat. Um, and teaching and learning materials. There's exemplars, lesson plans, course planner, and much more. Results Plus is support for exam preparation and post results. And it's a free online results analysis tool for teachers. It provides a detailed breakdown of student performance identifies topics and questions where students could benefit from further learning. It benchmarks your school's performance against other Edexcel schools. But it's not just a post results tool. Mock exams can also be fed in the, to the system to produce analysis. You can find students' results analysis from their previous school and it gives your students direct access, access to their final grades and performance breakdown wherever they are. Schools need to sign up for it, but it is free. You just sign up for a free results plus account. Uh, and it's based, it's linked to 
e-pen marking. All the mar all the exam papers are scanned. They they taken in a traditional manner. They're scanned into a system which enables examiners to mark a question at a time, and different examiners may mark different um, questions on the same paper. Uh, they're all marked digitally, and then it's consolidated into a central system, which is used to provide the analysis in Results Plus. Another resource you might find very useful is Exam Wizard, which is a free tool which allows you to make homework assignments, topic tests, mock exams. Um, it uses past paper or past questions. Um, they're tagged against the unit, topic and assessment objective. So you can um, use it to create your own paper on a particular topic, drawing from all the, um, from the bank of questions. Uh, the mark schemes are there, the examiner report is there, and it means that the most recent exam content is available sooner. Access to scripts is another self-service online free and instant resource available from results day onwards. It allows you to see all your students' mark papers. It's available for all qualifications and is accessed through Edexcel Online. The scripts don't have examiner annotation on them, but they do have the marks awarded for each question. Using Results Plus and access to scripts will help you identify topics and skills where your students could benefit from further learning. And it will also help you make decisions about EARs. Pearson Publishing supports a modular approach in line with the latest specifications, which are recognized by universities worldwide and fully comparable to UK reform and GCE A levels. It's got exam practice, it's got international content, embedded transferable skills, and it's reviewed by a language specialist to ensure the book is clear and accessible. And the final uh, resource to help you with teaching at Excel Biology is your dedicated sub subject advisor. Tim, and you can contact him using the information on the slide. That brings me to the end of the presentation. Has anybody got any questions? Please tap them in, chat, put them into the chat box. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Perhaps Ellie can answer the question about access to the PowerPoint. Unit three is experimental questions or practical skills questions using the, using the practices, the core practicals on unit one and unit two. And unit six is also practical skills, but that one will use not only practic core practicals from unit four and five, but also units one and two. And standard practical techniques, use of particular apparatus, um, how to make results reliable, uh, that sort of thing.
Right. I will leave the meeting now. Thank you all for your attendance today, and I hope that was useful. I will leave you in the hands of Ellie to um, try and sort out problems with the PowerPoint. Thank you for attending. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Jillian, and thank you everyone for attending today's session. We hope you found it useful. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.